Hi everybody, welcome to this module called An Introduction to Book History where uh, it's I will divide up this set of discussions into three lectures for your convenience. Now in this first section which I have titled What is the History of Books? Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about what book history is. I have borrowed the title of this module from a famous 1982 essay by Robert Danto, which is called What is the History of Books? It was published in the D. Dallas Journal. Now, the recent decades have seen the rise of the history of the book, or simply as we call it book history, as an academic discipline in its own right, with more and more courses taught on the same. It has seen the growth of a body of scholarly work, books, journals, conferences, workshops, centers for research. In terms of methodology, it's diverse, some of which we'll discuss in the course of this session. And it's interdisciplinary in nature, located between the domain of textual scholarship and the physical work of archiving, curating and preserving books. The central subject of book history, in the words of Matthew Simons and Earl Havens, is a form of technology that has become so universal chronologically and geographically as to be considered almost natural. The material landscape within which the historical record is most clearly preserved and communicated across time. This technology is of course the book. Now Finkelstein and McCleary in their, in, in their introduction to the volume an introduction to book history. It's a 2005 volume. They observe that book historians might be seen primarily asking the following questions. First and foremost, they might be seen asking, what is a text? In their words, I'm quoting them now, a text is a written document which is read, but a text has to have a physical form. This physical form could be anything from a printed book to a Kindle edition of the same. Secondly, they might be seen asking, what is a book? Books are physical objects, undoubtedly. But yet again, a pre-print era book, a codex, is not the same as the printed book in its many avatars. Or, you know, a photocopied reader in a dusty Dill University library. Or the Kindle edition of the same book in an e-reader. Indeed, as contemporary global scholarship on the book has highlighted, such as the work of Caroline Wigington, reading the illustrations of Native American and indigenous pipes as books, forms of writing, literature, rhetorical object and communicative practice, must necessarily be understood in diverse terms in order to ensure that voices like that of Native Americans are not erased. Just yesterday, I was listening to the plenary session of the uh, annual Sharp Book History Conference where one of the presenters was talking about a traditional drum as a mode of communication. Contemporary scholarship such as the work of Juliet Fleming or Jeffrey Todd Knight in a volume titled The Unfinished Book. They draw upon the work of Jacques Derrida and have also sought to ask theoretical questions alongside material readings of the book. Georgina Wilson, in a recent survey article, has called this book theory. Thirdly, book historians might ask, what is a medium? Medium, to quote Finkelstein and McCleary, is a generic term for the material form of the text. A book is a medium, a website is a medium, a screenplay can also be a medium. The plural term media refers to organizations, to broadcasters and to the press but also to publishers of the book. Now, Jonathan Rose and Simon Elliott, another, in another important uh, volume, in their introduction to a companion to the history of the book, published in 2007, frame the introductory questions of book history somewhat differently. They write, the history of the book is a new scholarly adventure, still in its pioneering phase, which offers an innovative approach to studying both history and literature. It is based on two apparently simple premises, 
which have inspired some strikingly original work in the humanities. The first is that books make history. The second is that books are made by history. They are shaped by economic, political, social and cultural forces. No book is created solely by its author. Printers, publishers, literary agents, editors, designers and lawyers all play a role in molding the final product. Critics, booksellers and educational bureaucrats can proclaim a book a classic or consign it to oblivion. And every writer must take into account the demands of the reading public and the laws of literary property. So therefore, the ostensibly simple and foundational questions of book studies framed in this manner with a cast of, cast of characters so diverse highlight the sheer diversity of book historical methods and the inherently interdisciplinary nature of the same. Of course, while book history might be deemed a relatively new area of study, it is important to remember that its roots lie in rigorous bibliographical analysis and description of books as objects. T. H. Howard Mill, in an appropriately titled essay called Why Bibliography Matters, points out that it is primarily the task of bibliographers to deal with the flood of books that issues from the world's presses. Bibliographers are and this is a fantastic example, really, it's fantastic, a metaphor. They are the good housekeepers of the world of books. Even though most books declare their origin and auspices on the title page or its verso, bibliographers must determine a host of crucial details that many people would think transparently obvious. They resolve issues that, you know, ordinary readers like us don't think about, and they put books in their right places. In the process, Bibliographers are concerned with the book as an object and how it can differ from another book with the same name. What is the condition of a particular book? Who owned it? What evidence lies therein? Was it censored? Are there variations in printing, language, spelling and punctuation in two editions? How has a book been printed? Now, these are established methods of bibliographical study that are integral to the study of the history of the book. The early bibliographical work of, say, Alfred William Pollard or Gilbert Richard Rich, uh, Redgrave, among others, were important work on the history of printing and the book trade. In the Indian context, be it the bibliographical work of somebody like Reverend James Long or the uh, magisterial volumes by B.S. Kesavan, post-independence, are of great significance to scholars of the book. Now, if one were to trace the beginnings of the study of the book in the academic world of the global north, one could begin with the work of the French historians of the Annal School. Lucien Feb and Henri Jean Martin's La Apparition du Livre, again please pardon my <laughs> French pronunciation, this is a 1958 volume translated into English as the 1976 book called The Coming of the Book. The impact of printing, 1450 to 1800, studied the spread of print in Western Europe after Gutenberg and its impact on ushering in modernity. The Annal School had moved away from the traditional history of elites and major events. So the coming of the book as, as a text, it used the sociological and anthropological techniques to the emergence of printed books in Western Europe and argued that the shift from a culture of oral and handwritten communication to one based on printed texts had radical implications for the ways in which Europeans thought about the world. Marshall McLuhan's The Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man in 1962 was another proponent of the impact of Gutenberg's printing machine in the global Again, in the global north, of course, uh, McLuhan, although, although of course McLuhan continues to be a staple of media studies and cultural studies, even today in India as well. Now, McLuhan makes sweeping claims about the changes made possible by the coming of print, which include, and I'm borrowing these, this, this catalogue from Robert Fraser here, who says, the stripping and the interruption of the interplay of tactile synesthesia characteristic of pre-print man, 
the destruction of the acoustic universe, the invention of perspective, the doctrine of scriptural infallibility, the infinitesimal calculus, the inception of natural li national literatures, exams and fixed orthographies and dictionaries. Indeed, as Fraser has pointed out, McLuhan took it more or less for granted that modern communications had arrived at one place and one period, Renaissance Europe. From this temporal and geographical heartland it had supposedly spread out inexorably and with the same general effects. Now we'll come back to this proposition later. The anthropologist Jack Goody, in a rather disturbingly titled 1977 volume called The Domestication of the Savage Mind, explores modes of expression, literacy and the function of writing in human societies. Goody believes that literacy makes possible abstractions, allows the establishment of historical fact and eventually paves the way for silent reading. Now, despite the very sweeping nature of these claims, it has had its influence on seminal works like Michel de Sato's uh, 1980 volume, La Invention du Quotidien, or as its, its English version from 1984 is called, The Practice of Everyday Life. De Sato considers the emergence of silent reading to be one of the fundamental cleavages of modernity. And now we come to a very important volume. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein's 1979 volume, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, is perhaps one of the most significant volumes in this regard. Eisenstein's work is the epitome of the claim that books make history, as she observes the transformations brought forth by the emergence of the letter press. <coughs> My apologies. As far as Eisenstein is concerned, print was an unacknowledged revolution. The invention of movable type and the printing press allowed the spread of knowledge to a wider population in Europe than simply the literate elite and the church. <coughs> My apologies, one minute. Thank you. To go back to Eisenstein, more and more people read for themselves. The Renaissance interest in classical scholarship, the Protestant Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, all were enabled by the technology of print by movable type. <coughs> Eisenstein further argued that print was made possible, and rather not was made, but rather print made possible the emergence of definitive editions and thereby allowed the settling down of fixed vernaculars leading to the emergence of national literatures. See, English literature, for example. The critique of Eisenstein's work has emerged now from many quarters. So medieval scholars have pointed out that the dissemination of intellectual discourse prior to Gutenberg was <coughs> not as scarce as one might imagine. While historians of religion have pointed out that it was not just Catholic Protestants but also Catholics who were part and parcel of the process of book production. Bibliographers have critiqued the notion of definitive editions and the book as a stable entity. While scholars of medieval Asia have pointed to the circulations of Greek and Latin scholarship in the Arab world, Eisenstein's book nonetheless continues to be a very important work of scholarship, not in the least because of the manner in which it successfully locates the ubiquitous and humble book as an agent of change. Walter J. Ohm, in the 1982 volume, Orality and Literacy, The Technologizing of the Word, sought to synthesize the work of McLuhan, Goody and Eisenstein as he explored the transition from orality to literacy, its influence on culture and on human consciousness. Now, Ong understands writing as a technology that must be obtained with considerable labor and in the process marks a transition from the domain of sound to sight. It gives rise to literature in the modern sense of the term, placing an emphasis on concepts such as originality, and leading to the legal regime of copyright. Now, 1982 would also be the year 
in which Darto would publish the essay which uh, this module borrows its title from, What is the History of Books? and propose his famous model of the communications circuit. If you take a look at the model here, look at you can see the, 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 the diverse agents who are part and parcel of the cycle of, of, of the circuit as opposed to simply the author. So you have the author and the publisher, you have printers, compositors, pressmen, warehousemen, you have the suppliers who supply paper, ink, type and of course their labor. You have shippers, you have agents, you also have smugglers, you have wagoners, etc. People who make the shipping of books possible. You have booksellers, you know, wholesalers, retailers, peddlers, binders. You have readers. Some readers buy a book, some readers borrow a book, some readers might even steal a book. Some readers might take a book and bind it on their own at home. You have clubs, you have libraries. So this entire communications circuit become central to the study of book history. In uh, Padmini Remure and Claire Squires in their 2012 essay, many, many years later, on digital publishing, revisit this very communication circuit and explore the emergence of what they call an emerging digital public communication circuit fit for the 21st century. Now, I do not have the space to really engage with their work in this presentation, but I want to draw your attention to this fantastic diagram, one of the few that they use, that of the digital self-publishing -publish communication circuit. So, self-publishing is especially, in, I, I, this is not to suggest self-publishing didn't exist before, but self-publishing in the digital era with the intervention of agents like Amazon operates in a very different way. So, there representation of the circuit and you know the role played by freelancers and outsourced, outsourced agencies, the prominent place of course played by the digital device, this remakes the circuit in new and interesting ways that again is up for 21st century scholars to explore. But to return to Dato's 1984 volume. Uh, the Great Cat Massacre and other episodes of French cultural history, uh, again a seminal volume, it has a cast of characters such as printers, apprentices in early modern France, the 18th century version of the Little Red Riding Hood, folk tales such as Mother Goose, an obscure 1768 manuscript from the city of Montpellier, police records and so on. Zarto, who is till date a seminal figure in the scholarship of book history. His new book came out this year. In this set of essays, what he does is that he expands the scope of the study of the book to minor and neglected volumes, to the human figures behind the production of the book and the conditions of their labor, to questions about censorship and the state. In the words of Eliot and Rose, they inspired other scholars to pose similar questions about books and historical causation. Did escalating press rhetoric precipitate the French reign of terror and American civil war? Did Samizdat literature in Russia contribute to the implosion of Soviet communism? So on and so forth. Now it should be noted that most of this work that I have been talking about so far, emerging out of the global north in the 70s and the 80s, so seminal to the study of the book even today remains primarily Eurocentric, comfortably assuming the Gutenberg moment in Western Europe as a starting point of sorts. Now, despite the anthropological references to communities such as those in Africa, such as in Jack Goody's work, the reference is of course to a savages, which is a very uh, disturbing and racist representation. But again, the unicentrism of these works do not take into account the emergence of woodblock printing in China mid 7th century onwards or its expansion to Korea and Japan by the 9th century. It does not take into account block printing in the 9th and 10th centuries in the Middle East or even the discovery of movable type in China in, 10, in 1040 AD and it spread to Korea by the 12th century. Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, uh, 1983 and then 1991, alone makes 
provocative arguments about worldwide print capitalism, which brought about a national consciousness through the rise of vernacular print in Europe, North America, and by extension in South America, Asia, and even Africa. Now, the sweeping claims of much of this early scholarship on print has come under scrutiny in present-day scholarship. Problematizing notions such as the so-called transition from manuscript to print or the modernity of silent reading, to offer just a couple of examples. The location of the study of book history in the Global South has produced a body of work that challenges this Eurocentrism. To offer a small example, Uh, to offer a small example, uh, Cynthia Brokaw's study of the state of the discipline of book history in pre-modern China points to the fact that there is a long history of the study of print and bibliography in China. Now, given the long and rich history of printing in China and the high status granted to books and textual knowledge from a very early period, it is not surprising that there is a long tradition of scholarship of books in China. Modern scholar Cao Zi, in his introductory text on the study of Chinese books, traces the origins of this tradition to the first century BC, to the bibliographical classifications developed by the Han imperial librarian Liu Jiang in his seven epitomies. Now, this early passion for books and records about books is reaffirmed in the rich store of catalogues and bibliographies produced throughout the course of pre-modern Chinese history. Brokaw further observes that with the emergence of book history as a discipline, following the work of Webb and Martin, there has been considerable inquiry into the culture of books and the social history of print in China. Now, in her own words, again, Within the past two decades, a number of works, largely in Japanese and Western languages, have applied Feb and Martin's methods to China. Scholars of the Chinese book ask questions similar to those posed by their colleagues in Western society, but they have also had to frame new and different questions specific to China's distinctive society and history and to the sources available to historians of the Chinese book. For however much these scholars may have been, and continue to be inspired by the work of their colleagues in European and American history, they are inevitably lighting a history that is quite divergent in content and approach from that of the Western book. The differences in linguistic landscape, social structure, political organization, economic forms, and book technologies are simply too great. Now, this shift from Europe to China, with its long tradition of technologies of writing, book production, and the development of movable type transforms, you know, the sweeping narratives about the coming of print that is so central to the study of the book in the global north. In the next lecture, I will be talking a little bit more about this from the perspective of the history of the book in India. Now, in the final sections of this lecture, I will briefly sort of have a, offer an overview of the different areas of work that book history might entail. So, uh, if you take a look at the screen again, so first and foremost, you could talk about the human agents to follow that those circuit. You have the authors and publishers. A classic example here might be David McKitterick's three-volume history of the Cambridge University Press, which also was brought out by the Cambridge University Press, or a book like Isabel Hofmeyer's Gandhi's Printing Press. You would have the print workers and the stationers. You know, H.S. Bennett's 1952 classic is an early example. English Books and Readers, 1475 to 1557, being a study of the, in the history of the book trade from Caxton to the incorporation of the stationer's company. So, this is the, these are the people who made the book. You could talk about distribution and circulation. Again, Isabel Hofmeyer's Portable Bunyan is a fantastic example of this. You could, of course, talk about readers. Kate Flint's The Woman Reader, or Leah Price and Matthew Duberry's uh, recently edited volume, Further Reading. You could talk about the technical aspects, the different types of printing presses and typography, lithography, letterpress, uh, the coming of offset, uh, DTP, so on and so forth, paper, Joshua Calhoun's The Nature of the Page, poetry, paper making, and the ecology of text in Renaissance England. 
or you know oriented the roles paper in medieval england from pulp to fictions again are good examples of this kind of work both books are very recent volumes that came out in 2020 one could talk about other dimensions as well archiving bibliography state and censorship piracy very exciting thing if you ask me such as you know the pirated books that one sell one might find in the footpaths of delhi uh, in connaught place for example digit uh, and of course the question of the digital book with the emergence of digital book and digital reading devices as i have given uh, as the example of you know ray murray's work and the digital publications circuit points to book historians are also increasingly embracing the digital humanities now digital humanities is a term that you know appears with considerable frequency it basically of course it has it, it it can be credited to the levels of access by digitizing old and rare books like you know in google books or the archive internet archive but digitized projects also allow us to ask specific research questions that cannot necessarily be answered through books in their digital analog forms some of this we'll discuss in the final module of this discussion but to offer a small example now in black et al in their essay published in 1998 make the case for the use of geographical information systems or gis in book scholarship in my own work albeit in a very small scale i have used gis to map the regional pattern of expansion of printing presses in 19th century calcutta plotting them in the maps and sort of tracing their expansion in various locations in the city at the time this kind of work has immense potential and it helps us to again ask questions that i could not necessarily ask or perhaps it would be too cumbersome to do so in a physical form but again i will for now pause this broad overview and hope that i have been offered to i have been able to offer a glimpse of the discipline in all its diverse and interdisciplinary glory more later have a good day